I'd like you to put your hands together. Clasp is the word, but that's not a very blokey word, but that's what I want you to do. I want you to put your hands together like that, firmly, and I'd like you to hold them there, firmly like that. And what I want to say to you, if you've got your right thumb on top, you are the strong ones amongst us. If you've got your left thumb on top, you are the intelligent ones amongst us. <clears throat> if, if you've got them like this, you are the strong, sexy, intelligent ones. <laughs> and if you've swapped your thumbs, <laughs> you might be a little insecure and a cheat, but who knows? Uh, I was at a place where they did it recently, that's why I'm doing it, and the person next to me swapped their thumbs <laughs> as they were going through it. <laughs> Okay, all good. Uh, let me start with uh, two stories. Uh, <clears throat> uh, one funny, one more inspirational. Yesterday, I'm going through the M5 tunnel. If you know the M5 tunnel over near the uh, airport, you hear about it on the radio all the time. There's inevitably a truck driver has got an excavator that's too high and hit the roof and jammed it. Well, I'm coming up to the M5 tunnel yesterday and heading into the city for an afternoon meeting and the traffic's slowing down, going to the tunnel, I thought, yeah, that's usual, but it slows right down to a stop and I thought, oh, there must be something happening in the tunnel. I, I get in the tunnel and I'm wondering what it is because we're doing about 20 k's and then I can hear the loudspeaker in the tunnel. Now, normally, if there's a serious incident, have you ever been there? What they do is they cut into your radio. The first time I'm driving through the tunnel and they cut into my radio, I thought, is this God talking to me? This voice comes over my, it just breaks into your radio. But it wasn't breaking into my radio. I could hear it outside on the speakers, you see. So I wound down my window and you know what it was? In the M5 tunnel at quarter to three yesterday afternoon was a mature age male riding a bike on the left lane. Now, inside that tunnel, the strip is about that wide. It looked like Mr. Bean, fair dinkum. The truck driver in front of me is tooting his horn, laughing his head off. Here is this man in the middle of the M5 tunnel in the left lane on a bike. There you go. Another story, maybe more inspirational, um, is uh, a male who is uh, 43 years of age and uh, he uh, loves the outdoors. Uh, in fact, he... Uh, is a, um, uh, what do you call it, an acrobatic parachutist, a long distance mountain bike rider. Uh, he loves uh, uh, skiing. He loves rock climbing. Uh, he even likes mountain climbing. In fact, in May of 2001, he reached the summit of Mount Everest. So he is a real outdoor bloke. And you're thinking, What's so significant about that? Some of you are probably in your mind thinking, I can do all of those activities. Well, let me tell you about climbing Mount Everest. Of the 100 people who reach base camp one, only 10% make it to the summit. Of the 10 who make it to the summit, do you know one in six die on the descent back down? What's so, ex what's so extraordinary, inspirational about Eric Wayne Mayer? He's totally blind. At the age of 13, he becomes totally blind. At the age of 31, he reaches the summit of Mount Everest and down. I heard that story this week. I hope that just stirs you up. It stirred my heart as I, I actually heard him speaking about his experience of getting to the summit and back. And so my, my thinking about Eric is, he's a man who's not let blindness stop him from having an impact stop him from uh, developing, stop him from reaching his potential. And uh, I, I love those stories. Uh, you may or may not have picked up over the years with my uh, interaction with this church. And can I say, I absolutely love coming here. I, one of the reasons I love coming to this church and to events like this is because of all the blokes. I just love the fact there's lots of men here and I know that Jesus loves that. He loves that there's lots of men. There's lots of men from different cultural backgrounds. I love that and I know our Lord Jesus loves it. And uh, so thanks again, Ray, for having me. I love coming here. I get excited, I get nervous, but I get excited. One of the things that I really love to be part of now is just helping people um, develop. I love to help people uh, kind of reach their potential. So something I often think about nowadays is that God's gift to us is our potential or our giftedness. So God's gift to us is kind of what he gives us, our potential, 
Our gift or perhaps our responsibility back to God is to develop that potential, is to develop that giftedness, is to, is to work out how to uh, be very effective as I respond back to God with a grateful and thankful heart and give back to him. Uh, and to that end, uh, I want to encourage you this morning and maybe challenge you and get you to think about uh, as we look at work, church, family, that kind of balance, I do want to encourage you all to be thinking about how can I develop in those areas? How can I reach my God-given potential in those areas where God wants me to grow and develop? But also, how can we help each other? Because we're in a journey and as part of MBM here and the men's movement here, it's a journey that you're taking together like as a family. And so try and see yourselves as part of how do we help one another grow and develop. Uh, one of the things I've just done uh, in my work role, I uh, look after um, uh, some staff and uh, the company encourages managers once a year to, new, to do an annual development meeting. So just an ADM and it's not a performance review. So I don't sit with my staff and it's not a performance review. What we do is I, I give my staff a document like this which is just sort of four sheets and they have a few weeks to go away, think about it and fill it in and then ask them to ask themselves questions like, what am I doing in my job that I'm doing really well at? What goals have I kicked in the last 12 months? And they kind of go through it and then I sit with them and I look at their comments and I have some comments about it and we discuss it together. But one of the things I ask them to rate themselves on is how are they going at dealing with all of the, the demands? We call it managing demands and managing complexities. So in their role, as they manage other people and issues for the company, how are they going at managing the complexities of their role and the comp competing demands? And as I come to this subject with you this morning of family, church and work, I think for us, it really is about managing competing demands, managing the complexities of who I am, the roles I find myself in, and how those will also change with my age, my energy level, my family's age and energy level and changes. And so I think in many ways, it's, it's a balancing act. And at times, it's a delicate balancing act to be thinking through the priorities of family, church, work and then even as Ray prayed at the end some sort of me time. How do I get some time to, for myself, my own personal development? And I would expect, I'm not going to ask for a showing of hands, but I would expect that there are some of you here today that are perhaps dissatisfied with how things are in terms of balancing those three for you or perhaps you're dissatisfied with how the family's working out for you or you're dissatisfied and unhappy with what's happening at work or perhaps you're dissatisfied with what's happening at church. There, there could be, if can I say, if out of those three that you're dissatisfied or would love to see significant improvement in two or three, you ought to be getting together with somebody to talk because it's very hard to be focused and, and energised as we serve Christ and love others if too many areas of life are really out of balance and you're feeling that they're just not working. You do need the help of one another. One of the things that I do, because I'm a bloke, who's got a sinful heart is, whenever I'm thinking through family, church, work, etc., and thinking about how they're going, if I want to see changes in any of those areas, where do I look to see the changes, do you think? Where do I look? A sinful man, if I get dissatisfied with how my family's going, where do you think I look for changes? In others. That's right. I often sort of think, oh, if, if my wife was well more like this or the children were more like that, but that's not where I ought to look, is it? If God's gift to me is my potential and God's gift and it to me is my giftedness and all of who I am and I have the spirit of Jesus, I have Jesus' word and Jesus' help, if I want to see some changes or some improvement in any of those areas, I ought to start to look here. Inwardly, I ought to look at myself and how I'm going. 
And so that's where I think we ought to start to try and get the balance right. Now, I'm hoping some of you might have been introduced uh, this year to Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, I hope if you have that, uh, and some of you have grabbed it and thought, hey, I like some of this and I might like to put it into practice. Uh, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People have helped me tremendously over the last 15 years. I love them. I love the habits. Uh, I love trying to apply them. My family doesn't like me trying to apply them to them as much, but I love trying to apply them. And um, let me say, habit number three is first things first, you know, keeping the main thing the main thing. So as we look at the balance of family, church and work, first things first is this, we need to walk closely with Christ. So that's the, that ought to be the, the foundational principle that we kind of work at, you see, uh, in uh, Colossians 2, uh, uh, so then, just as you received Jesus as Lord, so when you came to Christ, when you came into the church family, you came in through the door that was Jesus. So when you, you received Jesus Christ as Lord, now that you're going on and life is complex and you've got these competing demands and you want to be really good at church, family and work, continue to live your lives in Christ, rooted and built up in Him, strengthen in the faith as you were taught and as you started out. So as I'm thinking through my life and thinking through these priorities, the closer, the more connected I am with Jesus, I think it, the easier it is to balance those competing demands on my life. So putting it simply, the closer I walk with Jesus the more effective I am in making decisions about every area that I need to look after. Or take my wife of 30 years, the closer I am to Alison, the more I understand her needs and that is the first step to meeting her needs, is it not? But I also know as a bloke that there's a very big step between knowing what to do and doing it there is a big gap between those two things well for me anyway but I know that the closer I stay to Jesus the more fired up I am about Christ the easier it is to balance the competing demands on my life I can kind of be thinking through so church family work or family church and work as I've been saying it um, how do we balance it? What, where, where do they fit in? Are, are they all equal priorities or are they, is there an order in them, you see? Um, and I think uh, my view, my understanding is that uh, if we were, if um, I was going to do a diagram for you this morning, if I was going to do a diagram, I was going to have the cross at the top and then I was going to have a line like the top of a triangle to, to uh, family and church, kind of almost equal, and then a much longer line down to the bottom where I'd put work. And the reason I put work down the bottom is because I, work, paid work, kind of formal work for all of us will probably come to an end before our life does. But... Church and family, so I'm part of a family, uh, I have my own family, those things, provided there's no massive tragedy where every one of my family gets killed, my, I will stay part of a family till I die and I'll stay part of God's church family till I die, but work might end. Although, can I say just recently at our work, we had an 89-year-old make contact with us. We, I look after volunteers for an independent Christian charity. We had an 89-year-old man contact one of our volunteer staff and said, Do you mind, would I be able to come and volunteer for you? Now, because we're an aged care organisation, you can't knock someone back on the basis of age. Our oldest volunteer, our oldest volunteer turns 95 this year. How's that? Just given up his licence. <laughs> which I'm probably glad about, but anyway, just giving up his license. This 89-year-old man says, oh, look, the reason I'd like to do some volunteering is the business that I run is a bit quiet and I've got time for volunteering. He is 89. Oh, I haven't met him yet, but he is on my list. I'm going to meet that man and find out what's happening for him. But, so, but see, work will come to an end, so, but church and family don't. So let me just start with family. Let me just... 
um, start with family. And, and look, I'm mindful with a group this size and uh, in a church that's got a really effective ministry to kind of anybody that you meet. Uh, for some of you, family may not have worked like you'd wanted it. Some of you might be in a position where you've divorced or you're separated. Uh, and, and, and I want to say, I'm, I'm sorry it's gone like that for you. Um, and and uh, I'm glad that you're here. And I'm glad that if you don't know Jesus yet or if you do know him, that you've got, you, you've got some hope in the midst of perhaps a fair amount of pain a fair amount of pain that I know nothing about. Some of you um, may not be married at all. Some of you may be a single and therefore you may just be a brother or a son uh, or an uncle and you've got commitments to family that's kind of the broader family. You'd be a, be, be a sibling, you see, and uh, you've got commitments there. But as I speak just now about family, I'm thinking more about kind of the, the, the immediate family unit that many of us will be part of. And so I'm married to Alison for 30 years and I've got three young adults, 22, uh, 19 and 17. So I'm sort of, sort of speaking a little bit about the family unit. And, and as I've, I'm really conscious that uh, one of the main keys to a stable society are stable families. That, that, that the, the nature of familyness, the way that God has kind of set up human beings to live on this planet and to kind of, uh, for a male and female, to, to, to get together and leave their kind of their parents and make their own unit and then procreate and have children, that the way God has set up that, that unit, I think has a lot to do with what makes a stable society. And uh, we, live in a, we live in a society uh, at an age in uh, the history of the world where there is a lot of breakdown in relationships and it's very sad and if you've been there, I, f- I feel for you, but I encourage those of us who are in families to be mindful that the family that we're part of, the family that you and I as males are leading and directing and growing is one of the keys to a stable society. It's very important. We've got a very important role to play. Um, One of the benefits of uh, working hard at being a a, a good family man, in other words, a a, a good husband and a good father, is it can impact our health in a very positive way. Uh, Recently, I've I've come across a book um, by a man called Stephen Post. It's why good things happen to good people. And please, it's not written from a spiritual perspective. It's just written from a humanitarian perspective. And, and uh, this man, this could only happen in the United States. In the United States, there is a university that's got a faculty in New York that has been set up to study the scientific impact of love, compassion, forgiveness, loyalty, and all those virtues, which we say, yeah, that's how God's created us to be. They've set up this faculty and he heads it up, uh, this man. And this book is the most amazing book. I I found this book quite inspirational. um, And partly because he talks a lot about the value of, um, uh, for, for instance, marriage and a stable family. And they've looked at They've looked closely at the results. They've looked at the physical and mental health impact on people who have um, stayed long-term in healthy marriages and healthy families and how uh, it it impacts uh, our health for the better. So so there's there's a kind of a side benefit, I'm trying to say, of working really hard as fathers, as husbands, as family men to actually uh, work hard in the family and, uh, and, and... and have um, a side benefit of uh, perhaps enjoying very good health. Um, can I say though, even though I said I think it's fundamental to a stable society, the way God set up the family unit, my experience is it's not easy to maintain. It is hard work. It's, it is a balancing act. There is a lot of effort and a lot of energy and a lot of pain and a lot of heartache. But if God's put you in a family... I want to encourage you to keep going. You know, one of the things that they're not, one of the studies they've done, they did a, did a study with some, I don't know how they found these um, families that were going through tension, husband and wives that were kind of going through tension, but they had an attitude of sticking with it. Even though the marriage was hard going, they had an attitude of sticking with it and they interviewed all these couples and then five years later, they interviewed all the couples again and found that 80% of the couples, eight out of 10 of the couples had got through the difficulties and now were very happy in their marriages. So please, please, I appeal to you. If you're at a point in your marriage 
where you are feeling for whatever's happening, it's just hard going. And that little voice in your head is starting to say, why don't you opt out? Why don't you pull out? Please, I plead with you, your responsibility as a godly man is to go the distance. You know, I've been 30 years married. We've just passed 30 years married. And there's been periods where I've thought, it just doesn't quite go how I'd like it to go. But here we are, 30 years on, um, with all the three kids still living at home. Uh, th- things are fantastic. <laughs> things are going, you know, they're, they're relationally very well. And so, they, they, you know, it's amazing that they found, they work with these couples and found once they pushed through it, that they actually, 80% of them, 8 out of 10, were doing well. Just a comment, what about for husbands? Those of us who are husbands, so that's a you know, key part of the family unit if you're a um, a father and or a husband. So just a comment about husbands. Um, I, you know, I, think, I think if we go to um, Ephesians 5, I'll just quickly read that passage in Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church, gave himself up for her to make for her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word to present her to himself as a radiant church. In the same way, us who are husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For this reason, a man leaves his father and mother. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you ought to love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. So again, I speak here. Now, I think from that passage, the application, understanding the application is not rocket science. I think it's saying those of us who are married ought to love and serve the wife that God has given us. I don't think it's rocket science. John Maxwell, uh, he's one of my favourite leadership gurus, a Christian man who writes a lot about leadership. He was being interviewed on one of those morning uh, shows in the US. And uh, you know how the journalists, the people who interview, they like to be a little bit smart. And he'd read a couple of his books. And he said to John, he said, John, I read a couple of your books. And I noticed that, that they're very simple books. They're very easy to understand. And John said, yes. He said, they are very easy to understand. But he said, they're very hard to apply. And the, you know, the presenter just kind of shrinks back a bit and, and agrees. Yes, putting it into application. So I don't think it's rocket science from there, that passage in Ephesians 5. But who'd agree with me that that you know, serving my wife and growing in service and care for her 30 years on is hard work. I, I, need, I need encouragement. I need to see, I need to see some response. And, and can I say then, for those of us who are husbands, it's that, it's that ongoing uh, care uh, of our wife. It's, it's um, uh, being the servant and seeking to care for her in a way that she feels really valued is part of how we encourage and serve her. Obviously, uh, Jesus wants us to be, uh, if our wife is a godly woman, to encourage her in a godliness. If we have a wife who is not a Christian, that we look at do whatever we can to seek to build her up and uh, lead her to Christ. And what an absolutely marvellous story that you've told us about uh, uh, Sarkis's wife. That's just uh, that's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Let me say quickly uh, summarise the family section by saying uh, three things that work um, a- as a husband and three things that don't work. Uh, now, I- I've got a little bragging point. I hope you'll forgive me. I don't know if I've showed you. Have I showed you this book before? I may have. It's my little bragging point. Um, at our 20, on our 25th wedding anniversary, we were out uh, just having a day out together and my wife uh, bought me this book. And I thought, what men really think about. She finally understands me. She gave this to me on my uh, 25th um, wedding anniversary. <laughs> that, that's all it is, look. <laughs> I thought she really understands me. <laughs> So can I say, on the basis of um, uh, the word that we've just said in there, can I say uh, what really works uh, for us as husbands is to understand that it's spelt 
Um, L-I-S-T-E-N or S-E-R-V-I-C. It's spelt service and listening. So that's what one thing that really works. Another thing that really works in marriages is, is to love your wife like there is no other. To have the courage and the focus to be loving your wife like there is no other a woman in your life that's taking away your focus on her. And thirdly, what works is to give your wife plenty of time for herself. To give her time for herself. Let me tell you three things that don't work as we're thinking through the, our priorities and juggling them. Um, thinking that your wife is there to serve you. Always being preoccupied when you are spending time with your wife. So uh, another study out of here, 4,500 couples were studied over a long period of time. The overwhelming, uh, overwhelming response from uh, the wives was the number one thing they wanted to do was have their husbands spend quality time with them. Quality time. So... What doesn't work is to be preoccupied. And another thing that won't work in our marriage is to have too high expectations. What about fathers? A key part of uh, the family is uh, uh, fathering. About fathering. Um, can I just uh, say, uh, in terms of our fathering, um, it really, one of the key things is to understand that love for our children is spent time, is spelt uh, T-I-M-E, that our, our children uh, need lots of time. I may have shared this story with you before. I took my, when my son was 15, I took him and some of his mates out, uh, gave them some food, wanted to ask them some questions about how they're going, what could they change in their life. Do you know that these 15-year-old boys, you know the number one thing that they wanted to change, if they could, about their family life was, and they're 15, they wanted more time with their dads. They said they just would love more time with their dads, which I thought was surprising, at, at, given that they were year nine. But so when, as fathers, as we juggle that priority, it's uh, thinking through um, time. Can I encourage you also to be thinking through as fathers, um, having uh, fun with your children, to make uh, you know, fathering and caring for them fun and uh, I'm just running through this a little bit faster please watch your hobbies watch how much time hobbies or exercise takes up if you particularly have younger children three let me just tell you uh, three things that work in fathering, let me just, I'm um, sorry, I, I've real. oh no, I'm all good. I didn't think I started my watch to know where I was at. Uh, three things that work with fathering then is time spent with your kids, um, uh, shaping your children in view of the future. So always be thinking about what I want my children to be like as they're older, as they're adults, where do I want them to be in Christ, what sort of, uh, you know, what sort of attitude do I want them to have in life. So be thinking about how do I shape my kids and please err on the side of lots of love and mercy. So uh, for me, uh, family is for me, family is about being a father, being a husband. These days, can I say, as I think about my um, developing as a Christian uh, father and a Christian husband and uh, looking after my family, I, I'm thinking about how can I be the very best at it? So I encourage you, if you're not thinking like that, so I can't, these days I cannot answer in my head why I ought not try to be the very best at whatever I do. Not thinking I'll be the best, but try to strive to grow. And so as I think about family, I'm thinking about how can I prioritise my life to be the very best at the sort of husband I am and the sort of father I am and the sort of family that I'm part of. So what about church then? So as we think about juggling these priorities, and I said family and church are two very important priorities, what about church? Well, always the first thing, I think, is to find a good church. Now, you guys here have, a, I think you have an excellent church, an excellent ministry, an excellent growing church that's got a really blokey feel about it. Uh, you've got an excellent church, so you don't have an excuse there. You've got a good church. You've found one. What you need to be then thinking through as part of your priority of being part of the church is, how can I grow as a Christian man and how can I serve in this church? How do I grow and serve? In other words, how can my involvement in this church 
make this church a more effective church. So just, just reflect on it for a moment. Do you, th- if you were to look in the mirror and you had the word church, so you're looking in the mirror and thinking about this church and your involvement, do you th- look in the mirror and think that this church is more effective because of my involvement or not? Now, I'm a bloke, and I suspect many of you will think, is it more effective because of my involvement? Do I really make a difference? I suspect some of you will be thinking that. Does my, does my serving, does my being, does, do I really make a difference in this church? See, if you think you make a difference, what are you likely to do more of? What do you do? Won't you serve more? Won't you inspire people more? Won't you you be involved more? If you don't think you make a difference, what will you do? See, I work with nine staff who now look up. We will sign up our 500th volunteer next week or in two weeks' time. And I work with the staff and I say, when you're bringing on a volunteer, which... All of you are. When you're bringing on a volunteer into an aged care organisation, those volunteers have to feel and know they make a difference. Because if they don't think they'll make a difference, what will they do? They'll just walk away to somewhere else. And so we work really hard to help our volunteers feel they make a difference. And so you're part of a good church. That's part of an important priority that we need to juggle as part of the competing demands. But your involvement, do you realise your involvement makes this church a more effective church? Isn't that right? Absolutely. There's your senior pastor. Every single one of you. See, when I think I'm contributing more, that inspires me as a bloke to actually do more. It just does. But can I say, coming back to Steve Covey, Stephen Covey's habit number one is is, uh, be proactive. In other words, take responsibility. Can I say, you guys, you are responsible for your growth and development as a Christian person. Ray is not responsible for that. He is the leader of this church. The church staff lead you and love you and they keep bringing Jesus before you. But you are responsible for your growth and development. Or we, are, we, can, we can be responsible in a sense together to help each other, but I'm responsible for my, own growth, my growth. So if I want to improve, if I don't improve my serve or improve as a, a Christian man or a Christian father, I'm responsible. I need to do it. Can I say that what, one of the things that will help you a lot is if you can serve where your passion is, if those two can align together. So just recently, the nine staff I look after, I've asked them to do a little uh, survey for me. Um, They have three priorities. They only three things they need to do in their role. And I've said to them, can you go through those three things? Just take two minutes. I just want the gut reaction. Tell me which of those three priorities is your favourite. Okay, so they've, they've come back to me. A couple of them had to do it a couple of times, so I get the right. They've come back to me and said, this is my favourite priority. You know why I've asked them that? Because I realise if I can help them spend as much time in their strength area, they'll get more excited. They'll have more impact. They'll be much more attractive to the work that we're doing if I get them to work in their strength. And as Christian men involved in a great church and your involvement is one of your two, two really important priorities, if you can serve where you are passionate, the staff won't have to do a thing except perhaps troubleshoot you know, as you just explode into life. And so I, I encourage you as you're thinking about your commitment and your growing and your serving, to be, to, if you're not already there, and I hope many of you are already serving where you're passionate, Be thinking through, what is it that God's putting on my heart? And and engage with the staff. Obviously, it's got to work work in kind of cohesion with where the church's vision is going and and the direction you're going. But if you work where you're passionate, 
you will be very excited and inspirational. And there will be service where there are things you have to do because they need to be done. I've got a little a list, um, a daily list I fill out five days a week just to sort of keep myself accountable. And one of them is, what have, what have you done today that you don't like? And inevitably, it's the cat crap. I get that job in our household deliberately because I'm not a cat lover and I hate doing it, but I do it because it's got to be done. In church life, there are things that need to be done, which, which some of us, we may not always be passionate about, and we still need to do those as part of helping this church run and grow. But please, I encourage you to be looking to serve where you've got your passions, where Jesus has laid a passion on your heart. Three things that work, three things that don't work when it comes to church as a priority. One that works is you are responsible, as I said, for your own growth as a Christian. Another thing that works is you being aware that your contribution makes a difference to this church, that your involvement, that your serving, that you being here makes a difference. That works. And What works for me is when I come to church, when I come to a meeting like this, I ask Jesus on the way here often, I'll ask Jesus, how can you use me today? How can you use me to make a difference at this meeting in the lives of some people here? That works for me. I think it'll work for you. Let me tell you quickly three things that won't work. If you come to church or you approach this church with an attitude of what can this church do for me? That attitude, that doesn't work because you have the Spirit of God. If you've got Jesus, you've got the Spirit of God. He's gifted you to serve and to make a difference. What doesn't work if you come thinking, what can the church do for you? Another thing that doesn't work is half-hearted commitment. Who loves half-hearted committed people? Jesus doesn't. Revelation chapter 3, I had to spew them out of his mouth. Another thing that doesn't work is too much absence from the church meetings. Okay, your absence from the church, but that doesn't work either because you can't contribute and be building up if you're absent too much. Um, Ray asked me to make a comment about the fact that I've now changed sides, not in my football team, but I just changed sides. That is, for many years, 30 years, like Ray, I was a full-time uh, Christian uh, pastor and, and youth worker. Um, now I'm a full-time worker with a real job, you know, a day job. I haven't got that kind of casual... <laughs> Well, it is. They're not real jobs. The staff don't have real jobs. I've got a real job, and, uh, and so I'm no longer paid to go to church. That's one of the big differences. And so I think, so for me, for instance, one of the ways that I'm careful about the absence from church is that if my son and I go hunting, for instance, we try and make sure we're away Friday or Saturday night. So we're always back Sunday afternoon because we're all, we're all Sunday night churches now. We're always back for church Sunday night. That's kind of um, one of the things that we've had to watch when you're paid on staff, you've only got four Sunday nights off. When you kind of got a real job and you're, you're responsible for making the decision about whether it's church or not Um, that's one of the things we work hard to do and I've tried to make it a model for my son and the family as well now what about work lastly let me go to work and as I said I I see work as it's 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 a lower priority it's necessary but a lower priority and the reason I'm seeing it there is because work will end you see even for Ray as the senior pastor God forbid, but if Ray was struck down with cancer in the next month, he may have to pull off staff and his work role comes to an end for a period. But he still stays part of the church. He still stays part of a family, but even his work role could come to an end. And my my thinking is, if my work role comes to an end, as a priority, I can't put it up there and have it equal with my church and family commitments and priority. And I think the work for us blokes can become a really complex issue. You know why? If work is going really well for you, if you're in a work situation where you're kicking goals and you're um, working with staff and and they love you because you're the greatest boss they've ever had, and uh, the, the, the part of the company that you're in is really expanding, what happens? You start to get a bit of that, 
massaging on the back and that kind of cutos and, and your boss can ask you to do a bit more and you love it and you're, you're making a difference and what do you do? You'll do more. You'll give more of yourself, you see. It, it, this is why I think work's complex for us because if it's going really well, we're happy for it to give a bit more of us. You know that uh, you've, you've probably heard the comment that no male on their deathbed has ever been heard to say what? Oh dear, I wish I spent more time at work and less time with the kids and the families. No, no male has ever been heard, known to ever say that. I wish on my deathbed I'd spent more time at work. And you've probably heard the stories of you know, the people, the uh, worker, the senior management worker who just gets dumped overnight. I can tell you I know uh, one personally. It's one of the most tragic work stories I know. This man is 13 years in management of a, uh, a foreign bank that had started in this country. He was one of the three managers and was involved in managing the finance side of it. And the, the, the bank had had incredible growth. It got down to the fact that after 13 years, the CEO was going back to England. And this is how it happened. He knows the CEO is about to finish and it's one of the two other senior staff is about to be made the new CEO. The CEO comes into his office on a Thursday and he is expecting to be invited to be the CEO. And he is told that day to clear his office, they no longer want him in the company. It shattered him. He, he spent, I think it was five years before he could get another job. His health, the number of health issues that he went through during that five, it, it was just, you had this great long list. I, can, I walked him through it as, uh, as his pastor. I, I cannot believe what that would be like. You're thinking that you might be invited to be the CEO of a company. And the CEO says, we no longer need your position or you in this company. He had to clean his desk and leave that day. Now, you may think that stuff happens in theory. Let me tell you, it happens in practice. And I tell you what, you wouldn't want to give your all for a company that does that and not to have given your all to, to Jesus, your church and your family. Why work is also complex is this. If it's going bad for you, if work is hard going, that can impact your relationships at home. It can impact your energy levels. It can impact a whole lot of things if work is hard going. That's why it's kind of complex. If it's going really well, hell, I'll give more to it. If it's going really badly, it impacts who I am. It impacts me to the core if I'm not really focused upon Jesus, my family and my church. It's certainly necessary. It's part of God's design. You read through the scriptures that um, Proverbs, idleness is a terrible thing for males, young males. And so uh, 1 Thessalonians, you know, you should mind your own business, work with your hands, just as we've told you, so that your daily life uh, may win the respect of others and that you won't be dependent on anybody. So it's necessary for me to care for my family. Financially, I need an income. I need to care for my family. I need to have an income that I can care for others as well. So work is necessary. I've got to do something with my hands or my brain. And there's an opportunity to serve Christ in my workplace. For some of us, the opportunities will be easier than others. I'm in an independent Christian charity, so I can ask a person. On, I met with a staff worker during the week, and I said, have you got a spiritual life? I can do that in my workplace and get them to talk and share and we can do that. You may, if, for instance, if you're in a government school, I'm not sure you can do that so easily in a government school, but if you've got a lot of courage, and you might do it. But anyway, so some of us, we can do and bear witness to Christ much more easily in our workplace than others, but there is an opportunity to serve and to be like Jesus in your work. Three things that I'm going to about to close. Three things that work with work and three things that won't. Three things that will work is to have the right attitude to work. So I'm beginning with the end in mind. I need to work to have an income to care for my family. There's an opportunity to serve. If I can work where, I'm, where I really like it, I'm good at it, give thanks to God. But have the right attitude 
knowing that I care for my family and knowing there's an opportunity to serve Christ really 24-7, okay? That, that works. Let me tell you three things that won't work. Getting too close to other female staff workers. I'm in a company that is 90, my manager tells me it's 97.8% females and there are 2,700 staff. There is a lot of females in our workplace. My manager, my boss, is a lovely, godly man. His wife is currently spending half her working time in Melbourne. So him and I have a, an agreement that whenever we meet together, we meet together once a month for a staff meeting. One of the questions we ask each other is, how are you going with the females you're working with? Are you getting too close? And we're pretty authentic and honest. We push each other because we're in that environment. That won't work for you at work if you're getting too close. Another thing that won't work if work has you by the private parts, if it is going well and it's got too much of you, that won't work. And another thing that won't work also is if you're a bad model, if you're just not a good model, you're not a shining light for Jesus in a dark place, that won't work. It certainly won't work for Jesus and his kingdom. Let me bring it to a conclusion. There's a real, uh, there, there are real challenges as we try and balance family, church and work. There's a real challenge before us. It's, it, there, there are competing demands, there are complexities, and they will change. I think we need to review it often. Personally, we need to review it. Let me say, I started by saying that if you have a vibrant relationship with Christ, if your focus is on Jesus, if you're learning and growing and developing as a Christian, if you're walking close with Jesus, you're letting Jesus have his way and his say, it's much more likely that you'll be making good decisions about family, good decisions about church and appropriate decisions about where work fits in. So what, one of the things that works is for us is to walk closely with Jesus. The second thing then is to keep them in their right perspective. And I'm saying to you that family and church ought to be two really high priorities for us that we work on and prioritise, and that then we keep work in its right perspective. And when you have, you, you do need to work out in your mind just where they fit in. And you, you, it's probably best to do that with other blokes. I'm often doing it with other, other Christian males to sort of work out how am I going, where should it fit in. When you know, where, know something to be a priority, e.g. family, e.g. spending good time with my wife or good time with my children, then you need to prioritise your time to do that which you know is right. That's why I said there's a big gap between knowing what is right and doing it. But we ought to be aiming to do the right thing and to challenge each other to get family and church commitments and leadership for us right, and then put the others in their right perspective. I haven't, I didn't have time, I haven't commented on you finding time for yourself, and, and that is important, but I do know as blokes that a man finds time to do the things he wants to do. I, I know in my life, I find time, if, if my football team was winning this year, and it's not, if my football team was winning this year, I would find time to watch all their games. Now, thankfully, life's been very busy this year and I haven't had to watch their games, but I would. And so you, you do need to find time and make time to, to grow and develop and do things that help you maintain a passion for life and family and all that. But uh, often, can I just say... Stay close to Jesus and keep family church as important priorities and keep work in its right spot. Thank you. Thank you for being patient and I love coming here.